Discipline is a big topic. It can also be an emotional topic. Often, parents use their own experiences growing up as the foundation for how they discipline their own children. Some parents try to emulate their parents. What they've experienced, what they know from their parents, rationalizing, I did fine growing up, my child will be fine too, with the same strategies, the same approaches. Other parents use their experiences and want the opposite for their children. The parent feels traumatized or has residual anger regarding their experience and are looking for a different, better way to discipline their child. Whatever our motivation, learning a methodical and calm approach to discipline is beneficial to ourselves as parents as well as to our children. The following are tips from parenting experts, including Paris Goodyear Brown, Dr. Gary Landreth, Dr. Sue Bratton, and Dr. Becky Bailey. These strategies help parents experience success and allow children the space to grow without feeling overwhelmed and hopeless. Paris Goodyear Brown suggests before considering which parenting strategy to begin with, to consider which of your child's behaviors hook you. If we try to correct every misbehavior our child presents, we will overwhelm ourselves and our children. We will feel like we are constantly correcting behavior and our child will feel picked at and like they cannot do anything right. Try taking time to talk with your partner about which three behaviors that your child presents hook you, then asking what three behaviors hook them. Hook means the behaviors trigger our emotions. The behaviors are impossible for us to ignore and make us reactive. This exercise will help parents decide which behaviors they want to address first. It is recommended to focus on one to three behaviors at a time. Then, as the child learns and changes, proper recognition and celebration occurs before choosing a new behavior to work on. Before we choose an intervention strategy for behavior, we also need to consider how we are viewing the behavior. Again, Paris Goodyear Brown suggests using the analogy of different pairs of glasses, two pairs. The first glasses that the parents try on represent a parent's first look at behavior. Their initial interpretation of why the child is behaving the way they do. This is often our emotional reaction, and it tends to be negative. We believe that our children are acting out because they want attention, because they are impatient, or because they are liars and manipulating us. Then, we take off those glasses and try a second pair. These are a new style, maybe more modern. Through these lenses, we replace the negative belief we previously held with a new perspective. Maybe instead of, she is seeking attention, I can now see that she is really seeking connection. Instead of seeing my child as trying to manipulate me, I can perceive her as trying to express a need. Through this positive lens, we are able to identify the appropriate discipline strategy to take. It helps us to refrain from a consequence that is aimed at punishing our child and instead shifts our attention to an approach with the goal of helping them grow and learn. In Becky Bailey's book, Conscious Discipline, this concept is taught as positive intent. She recommends that before you interact with your child and before selecting a discipline strategy, that we say, I am willing to see the best in others. She says, 
we must suspend our judgments about the other's intentions and be willing to see those who act in hurtful ways as people calling for help. When we assign negative intent to children's behavior, it does three things. It defines the core of the child and their behavior as bad. We operate from the bottom of our brain where we believe that blame and punishment are our only options. It defines our child as bad in the eyes of others, including siblings, our partner, friends, and school staff. When we have positive intent, it defines the core of the child as good and it recognizes the child's behavior as needing to change. It keeps us in the upper area of the brain where we are able to think logically. Solutions are possible. We can identify which skill the child is missing and begin teaching. Lastly, it defines the child as one who makes mistakes and is willing to learn. Imagine you and your children are out at the pool swimming and one of your kids begins to drown, what would you do? Would you get up, stand there, and start explaining how to swim and coach them while they're drowning? Of course not. What would you do? You would grab them and take them out of the water and make sure that they're all right and help them to feel calm. It's the same concept is when a children is feeling upset or out of control, that is not the moment to impart a rule or teach a lesson. This is when we refer to our child's sensory profile. We work to soothe her psychology. Then we return to the discipline strategies. Now that we have chosen a behavior to work on and we are viewing our child with positive intent and we have helped them regulate their emotions, we are ready to consider which discipline strategy is the best. The goal of all discipline strategies are safety, meeting needs, and learning and practicing. There are three options we will discuss today. They include setting limits, utilizing a redo, and requesting a compromise. In choosing which strategy to apply, Parents must consider the child's underlying need. If the child is seeking safety, then setting a limit may be the strategy to take. If the child needs to practice a new skill or learn something new, they may need a redo. Lastly, if the child is not having a need met, they may need to negotiate and request a compromise to have their need met. We utilize the setting limits strategy when the child is not considering their own safety, such as running out onto a busy street, eek, when they are not considering the safety of others, such as when they hit or kick another person, or when they're unable to keep their environment safe, such as damaging objects, toys, technology, etc. Providing children with consistent limits helps them feel safe and secure. This method of limiting children's behavior teaches them self-control and responsibility for their own behavior by allowing them to experience the consequences of their choices and decisions. Limits set in play sessions help children practice self-control and begin to learn to stop themselves in the real world. Consistent limits lead to a predictable, safe environment which leads to a sense of security. Limits are not punitive and should be stated firmly, but calmly and matter-of-factly. After empathically acknowledging your child's feeling or desire, which is a very important step, you state, the Play-Doh is not for throwing at the table. Just like you would state, the sky is blue. Don't try to force your child to obey the limit. Remember to provide an acceptable alternative. In this method, it really is up to the child to decide to accept or break the limit. 
However, it is your job as the parent to consistently enforce the limit. The ACT or ACT limit setting technique was developed by Dr. Gary Landreth and Dr. Sue Bratton. It includes three steps to communicate with your child. You begin by A, acknowledging your child's feeling or desire. This is a simple reflection of the emotion you see on your child's face or what they may want. The child learns that his feelings, desires, and wishes are valid and accepted by the parent, but not all behavior is. Just empathically reflecting your child's feeling often diffuses the intensity of the feeling or the need. That was A. C. Communicate the limit. Be specific and clear. T. Target acceptable alternatives. These are options to try and meet your child's need in a new or different way. The goal is to provide your child with an acceptable outlet for expressing the feeling or the original action while giving him an opportunity to exercise self-control. For example, when my toddler, Annie, is frustrated, she may hit. She enjoys having fruit after dinner. She loves fruit. One night, she had eaten a whole orange and was requesting more fruit. When I told her no, she became angry and hit me. I used ACT to set a limit with her. I acknowledged her feelings by saying, Annie, I know you're angry because you want more fruit. I set the limit, but I am not for hitting. And then I targeted acceptable options for her. You may hit a stuffed animal, you may tell me you are angry, or you may have more of your chicken or vegetables if you are still hungry. Annie chose to have more cucumber. In this situation, her want was to continue eating, and that satisfied her. When a child is lacking a skill, the best option is to try a redo. This is a good strategy to try and relearn bad habits. A child may be demanding with stating what they want or need. For example, they may want a second helping of dinner and say, Give me more. This can be responded to with a simple, try again with asking words. This may include basic hygiene, such as remembering to wash their hands after using the bathroom or brushing their teeth before going to bed. Parents can ask their child to redo washing their hands before coming to the dinner table or redo with their bedtime routine before saying goodnight. Redos are beneficial with impulsive behavior. When a child grabs a toy away from a sibling or another child, utilizing a redo is a helpful way to quickly resolve the situation between the children. The first child has the opportunity to appropriately ask for what they want, and the second child now has the chance to share or to deny the request to share. Redos are a simple and quick discipline strategy. However, they often require much practice. Redos can feel ineffective to parents because often they need to be done over and over before the child is able to internalize and apply the new skill or behavior. This is one of the most challenging strategies for discipline as it requires the most time patience, and understanding on the part of the parent. Compromises are useful when a child needs to learn how to negotiate getting needs met while honoring relationships with others. In life, a healthy relationship is not one where one person has all the power and the other person instantly obeys without any questions, discourse, compromise, or negotiation. 
In raising our children, we want our relationship to be the model for all other relationships we will develop. An example of a compromise was when my daughter and I were working on her first ever homework assignment. Oof. She was creating an all about me poster. There was a lot of emotion. She was very excited. But we realized we had initially used the wrong size paper and now she was trying to fit the same amount of content on a piece of paper half the size. We were both frustrated and she was in tears. We decided to take a break. I suggested we set the timer for five minutes. She told me she didn't think five minutes was long enough. At first, I wanted to push her and tell her that bedtime was coming soon. You'll be fine. However, I recognized that she was trying to meet her own needs by asking for more time. I asked her how long she needed and she told me 15 minutes. We set the timer, and when we came back together, she was able to make decisions about what she would take off and what was important enough to be included. She finished the poster and was proud to present it at school the next day. Raising our children is challenging work. While becoming comfortable with these three research discipline methods, will help you feel more equipped and confident, it does not mean that discipline is easy. Raising kids can be a struggle. It may feel like you are doing and saying the same thing over and over without much change or impact. However, over time, little by little, change happens and the progress is evident. I would like to close with a story that hopefully you will find encouraging. The Struggle to Become a Butterfly, a True Story, Author Unknown. A family in my neighborhood once brought in two cocoons that were just about to hatch. They watched as the first one began to open and the butterfly inside squeezed very slowly and painfully through a tiny hole that it chewed in one end of the cocoon. After lying exhausted for about 10 minutes, following its agonizing emergence, the butterfly finally flew out the open window on its beautiful wings. The family decided to help the second butterfly so that it would not have to go through such an excruciating ordeal. So, as it began to emerge, they carefully sliced open the cocoon with a razor blade doing the equivalent of a cesarean section. The second butterfly never did sprout wings, and in about 10 minutes, instead of flying away, it quietly died. The family asked a biologist friend to explain what had happened. The scientist said that the difficult struggle to emerge from the small hole actually pushes liquids from deep inside the butterfly's body cavity into the tiny capillaries in the wings where they harden to complete the healthy and beautiful adult butterfly. Remember, without the struggle, there are no wings. Thank you.